This is uh, Admiral Chuck Kubik, who I mentioned before was the man who tried to be the intermediary in the, he was the intermediary in the sort of aborted uh, negotiations for Gaddafi's abdication. By the way, if you haven't read the um, uh, Accuracy in Media, the CCB's uh, report, uh, it, it's really an easy read because it's it's done in a narrative style. Although it's investigative, it has the facts and everything, it it reads like a, a novel. I mean, it's a well-written bad novel. You know? <laughs> novel? Well, novel it's right. Story. Exactly, exactly. Um, and also, if I, I might say, again, a... Uh, a first impression about the uh, the Gaudi um, report, and I think as as people read into it and particularly read his cover letter and listen to what he's saying, um, is that uh, he he saw as his job. I think I'm I'm not, I'm just interpreting what I what I see to lay out the facts not only in a story form or as an investigation, but document the facts with either documents or. Uh, uh, you know, sworn testimony and transcripts, which he hopes to eventually uh, release. And in um, in doing that, he said that he number one, you know, felt an obligation to the um, four Americans who lost their lives to tell the story, to put the facts out there. He also felt like it was important for the American people to understand the truth. And he also points out that uh, there are unanswered questions because of uh, questions that they've asked to the White House in particular that they haven't received an answer. So he kind of, at the end, leaves it open that there are still some unanswered questions. But his main point is that he's laid out the facts and he's asking the American people. He's asking the journalist. He particularly asked all the members of Congress to read the report. As Stephanie says, you can read it in one very focused day. Uh, you know, and, uh, and to then draw your own conclusions, because I think the one thing that, uh, that he and the other members of the committee you know, felt, they have an undying respect for the American people, and that the American people can handle the truth no matter how difficult it is, and once they know the truth, they will be able to do the right thing uh, you know, based on the facts as they see them. And that may lead to a debate uh, we're seeing it now in the different reports, and we've seen now a commentary being put out that is more narrative. But I, I think that that's really the challenge that uh, Chairman Gowdy has put forth: is to read it, look at the facts yourself, you know, connect the dots. To, to Roger's question, uh, the one thing that jumped out at me, uh, because I, I knew a lot of the uh, the information. When people say it's not new, well, we've been talking about it. Some of us have been inputting the information. Some of us lived it. Um, but the, uh, there was, you know, something new. And the, uh, as I hearken back, when I was here two years ago, I spoke as a member of the panel, and I talked about my efforts uh, at the onset of the war, specifically starting on March 19, 2011, uh, working actually with business colleagues who uh, were talking with you know, military, not with necessarily Gaddafi, his sons, the regime, but military officers who were basically looking for a way to uh, encourage the abdication of Gaddafi and basically wanted a ceasefire to be able to negotiate that. And we basically worked through a 72-hour truce. We had basically the conditions of the truce laid out, agreed to. There had been a uh, shows of good faith on both parties. And this was going to be between opposing military commanders pursuant to the law of war under a white flag. And we had everything worked out over three days of very, you know, active back and forth negotiation through intermediaries working with Africa Command and with the military that was immediately around Gaddafi. Uh, and we got to the point on the 22nd of March where everything was set except for exactly when it was going to be and whether we would hold the, uh, the talks afloat on a ship, either off the coast or in the harbor, or ashore on the former US Air Base at uh, Wheelis Air Base, which is right there in, in Tripoli. When I was trying to work those details, I was told that it was called off. And I asked to uh, speak with General Ham, 
because we, we, we were very, very close to stopping the fighting. And they told me it wasn't General Ham that made the decision. I said, well, I'm here in Virginia. I'm headed to the Pentagon. Who do I need to talk to? They said, um, wasn't the Pentagon. And so, and I said, well, I, you know, I need to uh, do something. And they said, uh, Admiral, we recommend you just let it go. And uh, I found out, you know, eventually that it was Secretary Clinton working directly with the Joint Chiefs of Staff who had shut down not that truce talk, but it shut down a parallel one that I didn't even know was happening uh, through a different, you know, business channel. What was new in the report this time that I never knew, I never knew about the 730 White House meeting uh, that happened between the meeting where Secretary Panetta met with the President at 5 o'clock and we knew that there was a communication between Secretary Clinton and the President at 10 o'clock. Didn't know about the 730 meeting. And there's lots being talked about that and the action items that came after it. But the one thing that struck me was it was a deputies meeting, but Secretary Clinton was participating. And uh, in her participation, uh, she fundamentally obstructed the direct order of the commander in chief because President Obama had ordered the Secretary of Defense to launch a rescue mission, do whatever is necessary. And the Secretary of Defense had given not a be prepared to order, not a warning order, he had given an execute order. And when they went to talk about that, there was a whole series of obstacles that were put in the way obstructing it. So it struck me that the same behavior that shut down the 72-hour truce at the onset of the war, leading to death, destruction, a failed state, was the same pattern of behavior that existed in that 730 meeting. That was new to me. The second thing that was new, ironically, we never did, even as Chairman Gowdy said, even have wheels turning towards Benghazi throughout the whole attack. But when it came to rescuing our Americans, realize there were still close to 30 Americans there, even with the loss of life. It was actually Libyan military intelligent officers who had been part of Gaddafi's military who actually were in hiding in Benghazi, who actually got the heavy weapons, the vehicles, and came to rescue our people. It wasn't Libya Shield. It wasn't 17th of February Martyrs Brigade. It were these officers who we had deposed, who in a sense of humanity, I guess, came and rescued our people. Otherwise, there is a good chance they would have all been massacred. So those two were fundamental new things that I learned uh, only by connecting the dots that Chairman Gowdy laid out there. So I would basically say to the members of the press, read it, connect your own dots, make your own conclusions, because I think that's what we're intended to do. Are you saying, though, and make sure I understand you, that Secretary Clinton derailed the President Obama's order to rescue? Uh, I'm, I'm saying the word obstructed, because they were there to, uh, to basically, uh, the, the orders were given by the Secretary of Defense at 7 p.m. This meeting was convened at 7.30. We've been talking about why weren't they followed. In that meeting, if you look at it, although there was a lot of talk about the video and everybody's reporting on it, the substance of the meeting was the Department of State representatives led by Secretary Clinton who put all the obstacles in the way, including the need for the country clearance, all of these things. We, we've heard, and this is all laid out. This isn't me. I, I read all of this yeah. in the report. Uh, is that the, uh, the secretary had the authority to grant those right there if they were needed. And so why it then caused all the delay, why people didn't move, I think fundamentally was the result of that 730 meeting based on the way I, I connect the dots. You know, other people may connect them differently, but it was clear to me there was a meeting, she was the senior person there, the State Department threw the roadblocks up, and the direct order to deploy was obstructed and didn't happen for some 18 hours you know, later. And that was, that was new to me. So that's what I learned along with all the things I learned here today. So thank you. Were your truce negotiations mentioned in the Gowding report? Uh, 
No, because he didn't go back that far. I think they're, they're mentioned, they were certainly mentioned in the interim report that we did two years ago. And I believe they're here, but he didn't go back to the beginning. Okay. You know, he, uh, and that's one, of the, that's one of the things that this report has done is it's basically gone back and I think Roger said, put it into context. You know, so I, I, uh, I, I wasn't mentioning it to the best of my knowledge. I may have missed a word or two, but I. Uh, <laughs> okay.